Hello. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fine. A better Life is a modern-day update of, of The Bicycle Thief. That's got an end element of uh, the constant sort of deportation. And if I read correctly, you're a quarter Mexican? I am a quarter Mexican. Uh, my grandma uh, came here when she was uh, 17 to be in silent pictures, actually. She was... Uh, she had a contract with, uh, with Fox Studios. Um, a, uh, Robert Flaherty, who was a documentarian, had been sent as a talent scout to Mexico, and he uh, signed up my grandma. And she was in the first Mexican talkie, Santa, which was in 1932. So my question is, you had said that she was part of the reason for you making this film was a tribute to her. What were the other reasons? Um... Well, let me see. I mean, I, you know, one part is to, is to get was to get back in touch with um, aspects of my background that uh, had kind of lain dormant. For instance, I'm the, I'm the first generation in my family that doesn't speak uh, Spanish, and I thought it was about time to learn. Uh, another was that the script by Eric Eason was the single best piece of material I'd seen in working in Hollywood for 20 years, so it was kind of impossible not to want to make it. Um, and also, I, you know, I, I've lived in Los Angeles for 20 years now, uh, and yet there's a, I've always had this sense of not quite knowing what everything that was going on, or that there were other worlds that had yet to be experienced. And um, you know, it, it, lo and behold, there are these kind of microclimates uh, of people living their lives. Um, often without any awareness of the other people uh, who are living totally differently uh, number, uh, a number of miles away. And uh, it was to, uh, you know, part of it has been becoming an Angelino for the first time in my life. But you lived here for 20 years. I had, but, you know, Los Angeles is a strange place because it's easy, um, given that the, the city is built really for cars, um, to... Uh, not really know your neighbor, to not really be aware of the different uh, cultures that have taken root around you. For instance, you know, I know there's a Thai town. I know that uh, there's an Armenian part of town. I know that there's a Filipino part of town. But uh, people are usually only aware of that um, from the point of view of going out to a restaurant. They uh, rarely get to know uh, one another um, as people. Um, and uh, indeed, there is this uh, this world uh, not only of people who are struggling to make money for their families and to remain invisible uh, to the authorities, but also of uh, people who've lived here for uh, many generations and to whom Los Angeles is really a um, a Spanish-speaking city with English as a second language. If you go to Cesar Chavez. Uh, really, you'll get along better if you speak Spanish. I think that's one of the amazing um, things about uh, about Los Angeles is the tremendous diversity that's contained within it. And is that the message you're hoping that this film will resonate with, is that diversity and the different lives that each of these different cultures have? I think um, on a universal level, the message is uh, that um, we're often not aware of the world's right next door to us in a sort of parallel universe. And also that the the difference in worlds can be just as great between um, a father and son, even though they love one another, as between two completely different uh, cultures. Um, because in essence, you know, I don't really have a big political axe to grind. Um, it's sort of a story about a father and a son learning to be able to uh, talk to one another, understand one another, and express their love for each other. Even if there's no political axe to grind, do you think that the current political climate is what helped get the film funded at this particular time? I mean, it's been around for 20 years. Yeah, well, I think that um, the it's, it's inevitable that this film is going to be seen through the lens of uh, the debate over immigration. I mean, I don't think we take any particular stance except to say that all of the people involved are human beings. Um, and so uh, numbers turn in, into people very quickly once you point a camera at somebody. Um, and we've been very careful kind of not to turn this into a symbolic uh, 
narrative. Uh, you know, one of the responses that we always get from people from people who've been even people who've been illegal immigrants or people who uh, are from immigrant families is that we got it right in terms of the details. Um, and there are all kinds of stories within stories. Not, I think not even the uh, the people who who work at the deportation center are really seen as as villains. Everybody's got their own um, uh, particular life that they have to lead. To lead. Um, you know, one of the interesting sidelights, by the way, is that um, Central American immigrants uh, are lower on the in the pecking order than Mexican American immigrants, and that there's a degree of resentment there because people have had to um, cross the border into Mexico from Guatemala, say, before they could even get a chance to cross the border into, into the United States. I would totally agree with you. You did not take a side on this film, and it is interesting to be able to see how each group of people reacts. I think you did a really good job of straddling that line without making it a, a political film. Um, let me ask you a totally different question about Homeway Industries and uh, their founder, Father Greg Boyle. How did you find out about them, and did you know that they were going to have access to the areas you needed to shoot, and how did that work out? Um, I was a bit of a stab in the dark, actually, at first. Um, I, I, I knew I had to do my research, and I started reading uh, books about the project and books about East Los Angeles, and uh, Father uh, Father Boyle was listed in the acknowledgement section of one of the books, and I thought, well, this is a guy I'd be interested to meet. Um, and I was able to get an appointment with him uh, and give him the script and sort of explain what we were trying to do, which was to um, be able to go into a neighborhood in uh, East L.A. and to do so without being the typical film set that just kind of buys out a location and then leaves, but to embrace uh, to embrace the uh, locality. Uh, and uh, Father Boyle really appreciated the way that um, gang members were portrayed in the movie, which is to say that rather than being about um, drugs and exchanges of gunfire uh, and the usual sights that we're used to seeing in TV shows and movies about East L.A., uh, you know, they're presented as family members or they're presented as friends or cousins. Um, and I think that to Father Bull, that's very important that uh, that we recognize the basic humanity of uh, of, of everyone. Uh, especially the despised and the feared. Um, and so uh, Father Boyle uh, immediately handed on the script to Hector Verdugo, who was his second in command. And Hector uh, went along with us on all of our location scouts and helped us find uh, the right places to shoot what we wanted to shoot. So eventually we were able to go to Ramona Gardens, which was Hector's um, old neighborhood, and to go there uh, not as kind of an invading army, but as people who were, uh, you know, welcomed into the community who would ask the right uh, people, and by that I don't mean gangs, I mean, um, you know, the residents of Ramona Gardens, whether we could shoot there. And uh, we really, really benefited from that friendship that we had with, with Homeboy Industries. And I, I feel eternally grateful, and I'm always going to be involved with them. Uh, because of what they do, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, I kind of went to, to Father Boyle last week and asked him for a job, basically, uh, and intends to uh, serve some kind of function at Homeboys if I can. Um, but we were, you know, it, it's worth uh, noting that, you know, when you see gang members in, in our film, they're actually guys who uh, are in the program at Homeboy Industries who. Uh, some of them are, are have just come in from the cold, basically, um, and it was really cool to have that level of authenticity, um, just in terms of feeling like we were getting the details right, but also um, in terms of feeling that we're doing right by by the neighborhood. Well, did you actually consider working with established actors before working with the gang members? We, we tried to cast the. We tried to cast the gang members from uh, the ranks of um, professional actors, and what we found, which I suppose is not a terrible surprise now, is that um, people tend, in order to get jobs, people tended to play up to a received notion of what a gang member is. 
as seen on TV, as seen in X or Y film. And that wasn't necessarily what we were going after. We wanted something that, even though it might be unfamiliar, actually kind of reeked of authenticity. Um, so, uh, way through the casting process, I said, well, we've got to, we've got to do an open casting call at, at Homeboy Industries. And Hector helped set that up. We went to Homeboys and, um, you know, saw about 10 guys and, uh, ended up using, uh, four or five of them. Actually, more, in fact. And, and with Damien Bashir, did you see him on Shea or Weeds or uh, where did you find him and what made you think of using him? Um, I had seen him in Che. Uh, I, and I thought he was just great. Um, I wasn't as familiar with his work on Weeds, but, you know, it, it's actually amazing what a transformation uh, it, it, there is between that character that he plays on Weeds and uh, and the gardener who he plays in this film. He, he really holds the camera in the way that the greats are able to do. And in part, that's because, you know, he's a big star in his native country. Um, so he has a tremendous amount of confidence and technical skill and ability. Uh, and for me, the extra advantage of not being instantly recognizable here so that when you first see this guy, you you, you don't know him, um, uh, which is different. When, and it's different when you see a, a recognizable star uh, in a film. I mean, I think that Denny is going to be recognizable from now because I hope that he gets the credit he deserves for, for having done this. But um, you discover him through the course of the movie as an audience member, um, which is which was a really fantastic advantage for us. Yeah, I, I actually I had seen him on Weeds um, a number of times, and I didn't realize that he was the same person when I saw the film until I looked him up. That's amazing. Um, yeah, he, he, he's really good. Uh, you got to tell me how you shot six to nine locations in 38 days. I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> it was all a whirl. I mean, you know, consider also that we didn't have a second unit, um, so that everything we did we were doing uh, with uh, one unit that was, you know, very, very nimble. Um, we we – we had a fantastic location uh, manager, Fermin Davalos, who was able not just to find great locations and often places that had never been shot before, but places where we could set up our base camp um, in between two locations uh, and so not have to move the entire, uh, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. Uh, but, it, you know, you're, you're constantly on the edge of, uh, shortchanging things, and I think we managed to, to shoot it uh, at the level of a uh, you know the level of a really good uh, studio movie, and not at the level of a crazy indie uh, film. Did you have a strict shot list that you tried to stick to when you were getting yeah. behind on whatever? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the, the first thing you have to do if you're going to be um, uh, Working with that that many locations is to have a very a very strict shot list. To have all of your homework done, you can't show up at a location and say, "Well, oh, the sun is in that direction right now. What are we going to do?" I mean, everything was planned out from the point of view of where the sun was going to be at a given time when we were pointing in a certain way. Uh, and I give credit to um, to our AD uh, Ricardo Mata and to Javier Garcia DC for being able to to work out a schedule that allowed us to uh, to do things very very efficiently. Um, I think there's only one time we ever waited for a shot. We knew we were going to do that. It was when we were waiting for Magic Hour at um, at the uh, the Rodeo at Pico Rivera. What were the most locations you shot in one day? Um, oh gosh, when we were picking up some of the um, the magic hour shots for uh, a driving montage, I think we probably, uh, I remember I took the camera down to LAX to shoot with the first crew, uh, with, with the first camera crew and, uh, and Demian and Jose, which is that shot that we got of the airplane um, going overhead. Uh, and meanwhile, um, Javier, uh, was uh, manning the uh, the other center unit, 
and um, he was picking up, I think, four locations at once by driving past. So we probably got about five locations or six locations in that day. What was your best day? What was your worst day on the set? The best could be anything, like, you know, just a great day for whatever reason. The worst day, just obviously, you were like, oh, God, I want to get out of here. What were those two days? Let me see. Um, well, I suppose the best day is the first day because um, it's such a, it was such a long road for so many people. Uh, you know, for Paul Witt, one of the producers, it had been 20 years of his trying to get this film made. And um, although I came on relatively late, it, I knew it meant a lot to him. And Father G came down and, and blessed the set before we got going. And uh, it was it was tremendous. You always feel like you're kind of getting away with murder when you're making a film which um, doesn't rely on uh, stars or uh, special effects or superheroes. Um, you know, the worst day, it's hard to say. Every day, is, every day has its challenges. Um, every day has its, um, its demands on, on your, uh, your state of mental health. Probably uh, shooting, I, I mean, I, I don't like night shoots. I think probably one of the, the nights in the parking lot uh, would have been my worst day because that would have been when my nerves were uh, at their fraying point, basically. I'm a guy who likes his sleep, and so, uh, you know, I would rather have a film that's entirely shot in daylight. Um, and uh, and everybody starts to feel that way around 4 in the morning when instead of losing light, you're losing darkness. Um, and you're you're just rushing to to get what you need done, and you've also got a kid who can't stay out past uh, past midnight. So you're trying to figure out how on earth to shoot um, to to shoot all these scenes with two people without shortchanging one of the actors. Final question for you, and this is the one that, uh, as I read all of the different interviews, um, when you were talking about uh, Paul Witt, he, he had the he had the friend who had the gardener. The gardener was had a truck stolen, and that was obviously the impetus for making the movie. Twenty years ago, I know, and maybe you don't know the answer to this. What happened to that gardener? Well, um, that guy was lucky. Uh, his uh, his boss helped him buy a new truck. Uh, but I'll tell you that um, in shooting this movie, you know, people would kind of uh, come over and say, oh, "What are you making? What, what's this movie about?" And they say, oh, yeah, that happened to my uncle, that happened to my cousin. Uh, the world, uh, this world uh, of very pleasant guys who cut your garden is actually quite dog-eat-dog. Dog. Um, and uh, once, you, once you see the film, certainly once you've made the film, you see these guys driving around in their trucks, very carefully obeying the traffic laws because they don't want to get pulled over by the police and, and start to feel tremendously uh, for them because... Um, you know, it, not everybody is so lucky.